challenge for the last four years at Alice Ferguson, Alice Ferguson Center. Um, I, I'm oversimplifying who Sandy Wiggins is, but um, I think the key point here is he is a developer who cares, and that's always, for us designers, it's always something we're looking for. So um, uh, he's a, a joy to listen to, and he's got a lot of experience on this, and uh, and this is probably the closest to fruition right now that he might tell you otherwise. You know, regulatory hurdles. So. Yeah. Too much experience on this. Um, oh, yeah, no so I'll try to zoom through this. So this project is called the Potomac Watershed Study Center. And it's for the Alice Ferguson Foundation, which is based in Agatee, Maryland. Um, this is actually the, the drive that you can come down when you enter their site. We're located on the Potomac. Um, 10 miles due south of Washington, D.C., where the river makes a sharp bend to the west. Um, you can see the little star on that, that map there. Uh, and that is a view from the farmhouse where their offices are looking up the river. And on a clear day, you can actually see the Washington Monument. So they do, uh, you know, you can see they have a 350 acre site. It's a remarkable piece of property. Uh, it's half native woodland, half working farm. Uh, <coughs> sits directly across the river from Mount Vernon. So the whole site, and the, actually the area around it, is protected under a scenic easement of the National Park Service, so you can't really do any development that's visible from Mount Vernon there, which is a, which is a constraint. Um, just a bit about the foundation, you know, the remaining programs, as I said, are environmental ed. Uh, they work in national parks all over the Atlantic region, as well as on their uh, Hard Market Farm Environmental Center. And many of you that are from D.C. probably are familiar with the Trash Creek so they educate literally, you know, about 10,000 students a year in their programs, and lots of teachers. They run teachers through the program. So um, this is, uh, you know, you kind of get the sense that they're serious about the environment. So uh, it was not a huge step uh, for them to step into the Living Culture Challenge, but th this was back in 2006. We've actually been working on this project for, you know, it'll be seven years in May. We finally broke ground on it, so it's under construction right now. Um, been a very long haul, um, and I'll just move right through it. We started, uh, you know, six and a half years ago by sussing out the uh, what we call the project step touchstones, the sort of guardrails for the project. What are the values that are going to drive decision making throughout the life of it? This actually preceded the discussion about the living building challenge, and then we moved into into talking about goals and uh, started with lead as you know people. Typically do, but this is in a workshop where the staff and the board and uh, some other stakeholders were in the room one summer in 2006. And living buildings were really just being talked about at that point in the green building community. The idea was just out there. The living building challenge had actually just been launched recently, and so they quickly jumped on this as something that they felt they had to do because of the mission. Um, and the conversation really wasn't about the challenge itself. Or, you know, there was a series of guiding questions like these that helped us talk about what does it mean to build a living building, and we kind of settled on this definition for our group, which I've, you know, used on other projects since then. That, you know, the, the idea that you can create buildings that are active contributors to the vitality of the systems of which they are a part. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through the living building challenge. You guys have been doing that all day, uh, but I did want to talk about a couple. Uh, by the way. Um, Materials, absolutely the hardest part of it. No question about it. You've probably heard that over and over again. We have a matrix that looks like, you know, Peter's and great grades. I didn't put it in here, but <laughs> you're welcome to, to have it if you want it. It's just me now. Um, net zero water is, is a, is turned out to be a big challenge, a big problem, obviously. Southern Maryland, where this project is based, is a huge problem. The aquifer is substantially depleted uh, to the point where most of the homeowners in the So we saw this as a real powerful opportunity to help change the conversation around that. Uh, but unfortunately, we hit the regulatory obstacles that everybody's been hitting. Uh, at the time, I was also working on another net zero water project in Pennsylvania and was hitting the same uh, problems there. So I just wanted to let you know a little bit about this. Over the course of the last two years, I've been working uh, the, my way up the food chain and now um, have a kind of collaborative with Alice Ferguson Foundation, which 
Groundwater Research Center in Pennsylvania. Uh, the Bullock Foundation is part of it as well. Uh, we've had conversations with ILFI about this, and we um, uh, have had a series of meetings with EPA National here in D.C., and we are very close to entering into a memorandum of understanding with them so that we can use these projects and perhaps other projects uh, that are uh, trying to achieve net zero water to develop a body of data that will enable EPA to create a regulatory framework so that people can actually drink the rainwater. So that's just an aside. It's kind of a side project. <laughs> um, net zero energy, uh, you've heard a lot about. We've been, you know, we benchmarked way back in 2006. This was one of the projects that we studied very carefully because it was you know, one of the, the most energy efficient buildings in the world at the time. Um, we benchmarked lots of buildings. our energy density discussion uh, and uh, but quickly realized um, I've actually been fortunate I worked on several net zero energy projects since we started this project uh, so this conversation has been a big part of those uh, realized early on that to, to really ensure that we were going to hit that net zero energy objective design was only going to get us so far I mean you know we can do the best we can to crunch down the energy density use all the sophisticated you know design techniques and technologies um, that we really needed to think about user optimization as a part of that. So we literally have been designing for user behavior throughout the, the, the design cycle of this project. Uh, and uh, that's become a part of my practice with these other net zero energy projects as well. Um, design optimization, obviously, we're looking for what's free, you know, and minimizing that energy density, cartoon, and, you know, the air flows from one of the buildings. There's multiple Also, you know, started looking at what you're looking at here is a uh, an aerial of the site. We have a lot of the PV mounted on the roof of one of the buildings. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But there's more that's placed in a, in a uh, ground mounted array in a field adjacent to the facilities. Um, and to to start the conversation about user behavior way back in the early design sessions, we were doing things like this. So what you see here is a um, you know a two scale uh, rendering of the ground mounted array, and then up above it. You know, here are things that the foundation staff are saying, well, we'd really like to have an ice maker for. Look how much more PV you gotta add in order to make that happen. And so this quickly helped them make good decisions about you know, put, you know, what they were gonna put in the building. Uh, because obviously you can translate this into cost very easily. Uh, uh, obviously, education is a big piece of this. This is actually a photograph. They have an existing lodge on the site, and during the charrette for this project, I walked into the bathroom of that lodge and took this picture, <laughs> yeah, which just cracked me up. 